Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. Good day, Martin. I'm glad we're back. Yes, I'm glad we're back too. It's been a rather hectic week, but uh, the Lord's been good to us. It's, um, it's impossible to do a week with oh, actually a minute without Him. I was just thinking earlier and telling you that if somebody would realize how some of the things happen behind the scenes, they'll, as we do, stand with open mouths and just yes, wonder and that, at what God does. I don't understand how it works. Let's thank Him and then ask a blessing for this. Yes. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for everything that you do for us in putting together these discussions. Thank you for that. We ask that you enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit and guide this discussion because we cannot do it on our own. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Martin, the titles are just getting longer and longer. Why don't we just write an essay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, even the titles are, you know, there's a small title or whatever, and then just before we begin, whoop, there's yeah. something else on the screen. Everything changes. So. Well, she has become a house of demons. That's, of course, a, a reference to Revelation chapter 18 about Babylon. Mm. She becomes a house of demon and a house of every unclean and detestable bird. That means she's full of evil spirits, right? Mm. And we have to ask ourselves, how did it happen? How did it happen? And then we're going to talk today about the papacy. Martin, aren't you bored with that topic already? Like I said in a previous one, we should just get used to this because it's not going to go away until the end. We have, we're going to be speaking about him and them for quite a while still. Well, you can't leave them out of the equation yeah. because there are... Two sides to this story, and unfortunately, he's at the head of the one side. That's it. Okay. I mean, we've got the three angels' messages. Yes. And he's in every one. So you cannot get rid you of him. You cannot get rid of him. So he's again uh, speaking against fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism in a general sphere. In other words, not only fundamentalism in a Christian setting, but also in a religious, universal setting. And then he has a problem with converting people. Yeah. Uh, proselytization, it's a, it's a major problem for him. So, uh, you know, the gospel says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And... Uh, the Lord says, go into the highways and byways mm -hmm. and bring in the people until my house is full. Uh, the Pope seems to have a serious problem with that. And that's a, creating a problem because then you actually moving out Jesus. And you are creating a command which is contrary to God's command. Now, that, remember that happened uh, in the time of Jesus? When the Pharisees and the prelates told the disciples, you will not preach in yes. this name. Exactly. Exactly. Eh? Now, how can the head of a so-called, let's really call it so-called, mm -hmm. because they don't believe in the atonement, Christian organization leave out its main role player? You see, the, the only time they can do that is if they are not the true church, if they are not true. That time when the Pharisees told the disciples, you're not allowed to speak in, preach in that name. You're not allowed to preach in that name. They discredited themselves as the true church of God. Then. Yes, and they locked them up, and the next day they were back in the temple preaching. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> so this battle is not going to go away, and uh, we will have to get used to it. And unfortunately, they will have to get used to it too. You see, the thing is, if they want to get this, let's call it maybe not one world religion, but a world understanding, understanding of religions, they have to get rid of Jesus. 
They and, have to. And it, that's, what, yeah, that's why they can't proselytize them. Wasn't he always a stumbling block? And he's still the stumbling block. I mean, this no one comes to the Father sentence is such a problem for these people. So let's go to some Bible verses to set the stage. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Somehow he has to manage to make darkness light and light darkness. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you do that? Christ is the light, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So if you remove him, you have darkness. That's it. So this is how he is transformed into an angel of light because he turns darkness into light and he removes light so that his darkness is the only light that's left. Amazing. And you know what? If you take it back to what we've said earlier on the two tables of stone, how the first table was lit, more lit that in the vision that Alan White It was brighter, it yes. It was brighter. He doesn't want you to proselytize, to evangelize. No. If you evangelize without the light, yes. Jesus, yes. then it's not... You, you, so if, what I want to get at is they've got a very social doctrine. We've seen it before that you have to hand out food. We have to do all of this. But the light is missing from that. All right, there are two tables of stone while we're at this. We're, we're off topic again. You realize that. <laughs> you should stop going off topic. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but let's, let's talk off topic just for a second. Two tables. The first one deals with God. The second one deals with your relationship with humanity, right? Now, he did alter the things in the second one, like he removed the promises. Yeah. Because you can't have God promising if he's the new God. He wants to do the promising. And then he changed some of the wordings so that you own nothing and he owns everything. That's the great reset. It's in, in his 10th commandment. <laughs> he owns everything, you own nothing, and you better be quiet and be happy. Yeah. All right. But uh, the first one, the first commandment is very specific as to which deity we are referring to. The one who took the children of Israel out of Egypt. That's the one we're referring to. That's gone in his version of the commandments. The second one, idolatry, has to go because everything that he does is idolatry. The third one is uh, the, the law of blasphemy, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that's no longer his third one. That's now his second one. And I don't know whether today you could go to Jesuit theater and look at any movie, whether it be family or whether it be PG or whether it be whatever, it doesn't matter from the lowest, whether it is for five-year-olds or ten-year-olds, they're going to have a blasphemy in it. Yeah. And that to me is the very worst. I, and that's the one thing I cannot handle at all. Mm -hmm. But they make sure that they will blaspheme. Yes. And the Jesuits are in Jesuit theater, Hollywood. Mm. So we know that that is occult because the Hollywood is the witch's staff. And we don't want to go into that direction. And the fourth commandment. He messes up the entire first table yeah. and thinks that's fine. And the world says, oh, wonderful. Let's obey him. It's terrible. But if, you, if you take that, with Jesus, the commandments are also light. Of course they are light. So if you proselytize without the commandments and without Jesus, there's no light. It's a total darkness. So when Jesus told the story about the return of the unclean spirit, Matthew 12 from verse 43. So when the house has been cleansed, now the house, of course, is talking about an individual, but he can also talk, about his church, because that's also a house in the Bible. So when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he says, I will return unto my house. 
from whence I came out. And when he is come, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. In other words, this individual had accepted the truth mm. and thrown out the garbage. It was out. The house was nice and clean. Now it had to be filled with this. Exactly. But if you neglect this, it's empty still. Then it's empty. It's nice and clean and swept, but there's nothing in it. Mm. It's still an empty house. And uh, the rules today with squatting <laughs> is that if the house is empty, you just go and move in, right? So back come the evil spirits, and they say to each other, Then goeth he, and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. So it's not talking about an individual, it's talking about an entire generation, it's talking about an entire system, we're talking about the last days. Now, it is also true that if someone has the truth and then turns from the truth, mm. seven demons worse than the first come back and uh, they are worse than ever before. I mean, we just have to look at people that knew the truth and know the truth that are in the rock world today that in public bite off bats' heads and things like that. Uh, this statement is very, very true. It's it. It, is, it is a horrendous thing. Now, when this happens in the religious sphere, when it happens to a church, seven times worse than when it was, mm than what it was before, before it didn't know what the truth was, then it learnt what the truth was, swept the house, got rid of all the rubbish, but didn't fill it with the good things. Yeah. Seven times worse. That's where we are. Yeah. So actually, in plain language, we're speaking about Protestant churches. We're speaking about Protestant churches, Catholicism, House has never been swept. No, so <laughs> it was the Protestants that swept with the Reformation. Yes, and now it's become a house of demons. A nightmare. So it's become a house of demons. Well, let's have a look at what's happening in the world. We first go and look at a little bit of history. This was in 2019 when the Pope criticized proselytization. You are not a disciple of Jesus if you try to convert non-believers. What a ridiculous statement. I have never heard anything more pathetic <laughs> it's true. It's, than it's that. It's terrible. I mean, uh, it shows you that whatever they say or what is in the catechism must be above the Bible because that's not in the Bible. No, this disqualifies him as a religious leader automatically. Uh because it goes directly against a very specific command of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Never, never bring the gospel. Let's just stop there. What is the gospel? The good news. The of good Jesus. news of salvation in Christ, right? By proselytization. In other words, you must not aim to convert. Preach the gospel. Fill the house. That's what Jesus said. So, but Francis says the opposite. If someone says they are a disciple of Jesus and comes to you with proselytism, they are not a disciple of Jesus. In front of an unbeliever, the last thing I have to do is to try to convince him. Never. Well, he's got a point in a sense because you can never convince anyone. The Holy Spirit must do the convincing. Mm -hmm. But you have to give the information. You see, the, it's a fine line once again. Because there's some truth in this. I mean, we've always said that there's this uh, saying that you must preach the gospel and, if necessary, use words. Yes. So obviously your actions have to show that you're... Oh, but that, the way he's true. stating it, it's, it's going over that line. Because now you're not allowed to say actually anything. You're not allowed to say anything. And this is exactly like the Pharisees. You will not preach in this name. Yeah. The last thing I have to do is speak. 
What is preaching? Just standing there with your mouth closed, right? Francis said, instead he stressed, I have to live consistent with my faith and it will be my testimony to awaken the curiosity of others who say, but why do you do this? And yes, I can speak then. Well, I want to know, why do you do this? Why are all these children being dug up that have been molested within the church? Is that a good witness? No. Well, let's not, not go all. there. Yeah, before see, we must not get hot under the collar. Be calm and collected. But that's true what you're saying. So they don't practice what he preaches in any case. No. And like I said, it's amazing how clever they can word something. He. Yes. Well, look at all the pictures of the popes standing there with their cigarettes in their hand or the cardinals drinking and partying. Is that a good example of Christianity? No, I mean, like you've showed in that lectures of yours, um, Food for Thought. Who owns the breweries? Who owns the tobacco fields? Who owns the drug world? Huh? They do. So we are not in the times of the Crusades, he said. Either the baptism or the sword. This has happened in history. They also do it with us Christians in other parts. They are doing it, but what we did was shameful because it is a story of forced conversion, if not respecting the dignity of the person. Well, he's right there. You don't, mm -hmm. can't force anyone to accept it, but to prevent them from preaching is diabolical. But what he also does is he says that if you tell somebody or want to preach, that's also actually forcing. So he, uh, once again, he's not doing the, 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 the line justice. Now, when you were out there in the world, you were playing DJ and all kinds of, of things. Uh, you saw somebody behaving so beautifully and decided, <laughs> wow, I'm going to give up being a DJ, I'm going to give up all of these things, and I'm now going to be a Christian. That happened to you? Not at all, no. Oh, did somebody preach? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> According to, to the Pope, I have and, to apologize. And he had to speak loudly. Let's go back even a year for, before that. This is Catholic News Agency. Proselytism versus evangelism. Today, proselytism is almost universally seen as a sinister activity when it comes to religious beliefs. On several occasions, Pope Francis has strongly condemned proselytism. He said it is not licit that you convince them of your faith. Proselytism is the strongest poison against the ecumenical path. He's Absolutely right. Exactly. That's where the whole crux is lying. He's spot on. If you want to have ecumenism, then you're not allowed to use the name of Jesus because he's a problem. That's a problem. You cannot get ecumenism if he's in the, in the uh, mix. Okay. And you may not preach doctrine because as soon as you preach doctrine, you have war. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is your problem, Mr. Pope. You want to walk an ecumenical path of compromising truth and error. Yeah. You want to sit at the same table with angels and demons. Sorry, it doesn't work. Yeah. Similarly, the Pope has said proselytism amongst Christians, therefore in itself, is a grave sin. I think... No, I, I'd rather not say what I think. But, well, if I had to say, this is a form of dementia. Yeah, well, this is exactly, he says exactly what, the, what he wants to say, because this, if people accept this, will put you off in the wrong direction completely. And I think the problem is a lot of people, even de uh, Christian denominations, agree with us. Yes. Well, it's either dementia or it's demonic, what are you well, saying? I think it's demonic. There's no other choice there. And also, he said, the church is not a soccer team that goes around seeking fans. All right. But Francis' strong language is directed at the modern meaning of proselytism. 
This meaning includes using any type of pressure to convert someone, whether it is moral, political, or economic. I agree with that. You don't have to use pressure. In fact, you may not use pressure, no. but you have to preach. Exactly. You cannot be quiet. And the main character has to be there. If it's not Jesus that's in the center, how do you convert? Where do you convert them to then? All right. Did Peter... All the other disciples have the Spirit of God. Yes. Were they put in jail for it? Mm -hmm. Were they chained on either side to soldiers to prevent them from speaking in that name? Were they beaten because they spoke in that name? Yes. Did they stop speaking because they were treated that way? No. So, I'm sorry, Pope, but you're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> <laughs> Go and find another tree and bark there. There's nothing new under the sun. 2021. Pope Francis warns against preachers who sow division online. <laughs> We're in trouble. <laughs> We're in big trouble. Especially because he said even Christians mustn't proselytize among Christians. Okay. So. At his general audience on Wednesday, Pope Francis warned against preachers who sow division and mistrust online. You know, Martin, I don't believe that we sow mistrust. We've put the facts on the table, and hopefully, as a consequence, people will mistrust the system. That's it. There is no shortage of preachers who, especially through the new means of communication, can disturb communities. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. In other words, Jesus came to disturb communities. They present themselves not primarily to announce the gospel of God who loves man in Jesus, crucified and risen, but to insist as true keepers of the truth what is the best way to be a Christian, the Pope said on June the 23rd. Well, let me say it again to the man dressed in white, which is, of course, his own robe, that if you preach the word of God, then you are telling people what is right. Mm -hmm. And if you do not want to live in harmony with that, you might have a white robe under it, but beneath it you wear the black clothing of a Jesuit. Yeah. And they strongly affirm that the true Christianity is the one they adhere to, often identified with certain forms of the past. Is he referring to the Reformation? I think so. I think that's what he's referring and I to. I think the keepers of truth that he's referring to is the Bible, the truth that we say, sola scriptura. Yes. And that the solution to the crisis of today is to go back so as not to lose the genuine of the faith. Yes, Mr. Pope, that is exactly what it is about. Go back to the biblical truth or else you will have to face the consequences. Not from me, not from you, mm -hmm. but from God himself. But Francis said that these new preachers can be recognized by their rigidity which contrasts with preaching the gospel that makes us free, makes us joyful. Well, Martin, we just recorded a sermon on freedom and a sermon on bondage. And in that sermon, I showed that the word slave mm. and slavery in the Bible, in the King James, is associated only with Babylon. Yes. And not with God's people. Yeah, and I think the rigidity that he's talking about aren't Seventh day Adventists um, accused of being rigid because we want to keep the commandments of God? Well, that's what it says. If you love me, keep my commandments. I don't want his commandments. Yeah. Let me put this quite plain. Mm -hmm. I was a Roman Catholic, I was an atheist because I was a Roman Catholic. Does that make sense, Martin? <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually it does, because that's part of Babylon, yes. both sides. I became an atheist because I was a Roman Catholic. Now people must do with that whatever they want. But then I became a Catholic even though I was an atheist. 
Does that make any sense whatsoever? Now, my father's side is all Catholic. Do I hate everybody on my father's side, including my father? No, I don't think you hate anybody. Absolutely not. Do I care about them? Yes. Do I want them to be in the kingdom? Mm -hmm. Absolutely I want them in the kingdom. Do I condemn them because they know not the truth? No. No. Would I try to bring them the truth? Yes. Absolutely. If somebody wants to find the way (laughs) to the next city and there is no signpost that said, here is the way, then you run into a problem, all right? So if someone asks directions to heaven, give them directions. And if you see someone walking towards hell, then please tell him, just tell him, excuse me, you know, there is a better way. If you go this way, you get to the celestial city. Pilgrim's progress. Mm. So I have nothing against Catholics. Half my family is Catholics. The other half is Protestant. The Protestant half is more stubborn than the Catholic half. (laughs) It just happens to be like that. So unfortunately, I have to proselytize both sides. Exactly. We cannot keep silent. Okay. Do I despise the ones that are on the Protestant side of my family? No. No. Do I want them in the kingdom? Yes. Yes. Uh, can you reach that kingdom on a ladder of lies? Unfortunately, no. No. The only ladder that works is Jacob's ladder. And that represents Christ. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I cannot adhere to what he has to say because it would be contrary to God's commandment. He also states that the new preachers do not know what humility is, what fraternity is. They don't know what brotherhood is. To him, brotherhood is ecumenism, Yes. but in the broad sense, as we have seen in Kazakhstan now. Yeah, take away Jesus. Take away Jesus and let's embrace everyone. Now, there's a vast difference between embracing humanity and recognizing that everybody is your neighbor Mm -hmm. and accepting the error that they believe in and making that truth. Mm -hmm. That That is a terrible situation. In other words, he hates his brother so much. Let me turn his words around. He hates his brothers so much that he is happy to leave them in perpetual error that leads nowhere. That's exactly the turnaround because what he is saying will lead them to perdition. Let's go to another statement. This is from the journal America. Pope Francis, religious fundamentalism is a plague. It's a disease, Martin. Interreligious dialogue is an important way to counter fundamentalist groups as well as the unjust accusation that religion sows division, Pope Francis said. Excuse me, what did Jesus say? I have not come to bring peace but division. So the most divisive person that has ever lived is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He's the most divisive person that has ever lived. But he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by him. That's divisive. The Pope has recognized that. So unfortunately, his war is not against the fundamentalist who believes every word. Because man does not live by bread alone, but by? Every word. By some of the words. No. Hmm? That's how they see it. Okay. How many words have been removed out of the new translations? Hundreds. Thousands. Yeah. Thousands. All right? So we have a serious, serious clash of minds here. Mm. We must beware of fundamentalist groups. Each religion has its own. In Argentina, there are some fundamentalists 
corners there, he said, fundamentalism is a plague. And all religions have some fundamentalist first cousin, he said. To see the dangers of fundamentalism, Christians must also reflect on their own history, he said, including the Thirty Years' War, which began in 1618 as a conflict between Catholic and Protestant states and the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre of 1572. Isn't it interesting how he sweeps the history of this church under the carpet? He's not... You know, if it's actually, if by his definition, the, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church is much more fundamentalist church than what he's saying the Protestants yes, were. Yes, they were murderers. They mm. killed millions. And he's sweeping this under the rug as though it didn't exist. You know what? Thank heaven for Sweden. Because the Swedes intervened in the 30-year war and helped Germany to Stop the tyranny of Rome. And now he has used his whitewash and drawn them back into ecumenism. The children has returned, returned to the mother prostitute. And he thinks, now we'll just forget about Jesus. Mm -hmm. We'll forget about the war, which is based on the word. And we will just be in fraternity in error. And look at how he twists. Every time they give new meaning to words. Proselytization, like we've seen, and fundamentalism has gotten new meanings. And, but he doesn't say it. He doesn't say it's got new meanings. He just uses the words and say it's, these people, it's not supposed to happen. I'm afraid the battle between good and evil will continue until the last trump. Mm. A bit of history should frighten us, the Pope said. Whoever doesn't feel frightened from within should ask themselves why. It is important to show that we believers are a factor of peace for human societies. And in doing so, we will respond to those who unjustly accuse religions of inciting hatred and causing violence, the Pope said. You know what? I'm so glad he's bringing peace to all the religions in the world. Because when they say, peace, peace, they will be destroyed because they will again have rejected the stone. Yeah. Well, Martin, therefore it is quite appropriate that this last meeting about fraternity that the Pope speaks about took place at Kazakhstan at a place which they call the Palace of Peace. Mm. Martin, are we... At the very doors of eternity. You know what? Look at this. In Kazakhstan, they've got this one. They're busy building those mosque and church and, or, and uh, um, Abrahamic synagogue. Centers. Yes, that Abrahamic faith centers. Not even in Dubai only, other places as well. This, it's all this peace and safety. That's coming being, together. Coming together. Well... Let's look what it looks like. Pope Francis' message uh, today to the religious leaders was that the religion is not a problem, but actually a part of the solution. He also said that uh, to combat the world's crisis, we must care. He stressed that um, as long as inequality and injustice continue to proliferate, uh, there will be no end to viruses, even worse than COVID-19. He said that uh, God is peace. He said that every human being is sacred. But each day, children born and unborn, um, migrants and elderly are cast aside. And this is because of indifference. Well, Martin, the architecture tells us everything. It's, it's occult enough to have become a house of demons. Mm. Yes, because there's a lot of sun symbolism yes. in this old... It's, it's, Totally occult. 
So if we have a look at what happened there in Kazakhstan, I think it's very important. World religious leaders adopt human fraternity documents. The world religious leaders today adopted the human fraternity document signed by His Eminence, the Grand Imam of Al Azhar and Chairman of the Muslim Council of Elders, Dr. Ahmed El Tayeb, and His Holiness Pope Francis of the Catholic Church in Abu Dhabi in 2019. So in 2019, when it was introduced, it took up till 2022 to have it adopted, and they all signed the document. Now, let's just make sure again. Who wrote the document? Pope Francis. So who's the spiritual leader that is leading the way? Him. Pope Francis. Who does the Bible say will be the one that, brings the world to the point of peace, peace, in other words, sudden destruction? Exactly, the Roman Catholic system. The Roman Catholic system. So this came during the Seventh Congress. Do you think they're, they're playing numerology here? I think so. Of leaders of world and traditional religions, which concluded on Thursday. The closing statement of the Congress which was attended by over 108 religious and world leaders, underscored the historical significance of the human fraternity document, stressing that it helps promote peace, dialogue, and mutual respect amongst people. Martin, I'm almost at the loss for words. In a way, I'm glad this is happening. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking the same thing. Because why? Because it shows you how near we are to the end. So let's look at the Astana Times Declaration of the Seventh Congress of the Leaders of World and Traditional Religions. So we, the participants of the Seventh Congress, spiritual leaders of the world and traditional religions, politicians, heads of international organizations, <laughs> Does that include the whole package deal? Does that have the whole world wandering after the beast? Absolutely, because they're all <laughs> ogling they're, his document. The kings, the merchants, the religious leaders. Recognizing the importance of addressing global challenges in our post-pandemic world. There you have the reset mm -hmm. issue. Uh, climate change, poverty... Organized crime, terrorism, drugs. Martin, if every nation would cut their military expenditure by 10%, mm. world hunger would be totally eradicated. Oh. They can still keep 90% of their military expenditure, just 10%. And then something to condemn extremism, radicalism, terrorism. It's interesting that he puts proselytization into the same category as terrorism. That's it. And terrorism only got its true meaning with 9-11. And that also, was also linked to religious. Yes. Which lead to religious persecution and the undermining of human life and dignity. I don't want to persecute anyone. Everybody can believe whatever they want. They can believe in dumb idols that neither hear nor speak nor talk. That is their problem. But if there is an alternative, a better alternative, should I not tell them about it? Actually, we don't have a problem with people making a choice. No. But they must be willing to accept the consequences of their choice. Yes, and in order to be able to make a choice, you need to have data. So that's exactly what we do. We provide data on, upon which people can make a choice. Mm -hmm. Now, Martin, there was a time in your life where you probably believed in Father Christmas and the, and the Tooth Fairy. <laughs> but sometime along the line, somebody said, excuse me, you know, the Tooth Fairy... <laughs> is really not relevant in your life. 
And then we have a realization, the urgent necessity for spiritual and political leaders to work together. Martin, is that church and state coming together? That, isn't that the image of the beast? Yep. And we have to come to a common position and declare the following. You cannot come to a common position when it comes to salvation. It's impossible. So, we note the pluralism in terms of difference in skin color, gender, race, language, culture, are expressions of the wisdom of God in creation. Religious diversity is permitted by God and therefore any coercion to a particular religion and religious doctrine is unacceptable. This is a terrible distortion. Mm -hmm. This is a travesty of justice. God permits sin. Therefore, we must tolerate sin. That's the same that argument. Is exactly. So they use wording that makes it sound correct and good, but you must really put it in place with what the Bible is telling you. All right. So why does God allow gender problems? Didn't he create the male and female? Mm -hmm. And were they, were they not supposed to be of one mind? Did he not give certain directives as to how they should organize their lives to be happy? Yep. Did humanity adhere to them nope. or change them completely? completely. Didn't they reverse it, in mm -hmm. fact? Mm -hmm. And then they wonder why we have gender problems. Mm -hmm. Race is the most ridiculous thing on the planet. In order to uh, separate people in terms of religion on the basis of race is ridiculous. Language. Now, who, who confused God. the languages? God did. Why did he do it? Because of man's sinfulness and wanting to be like God. Okay. So they were united in language and therefore they were united in apostasy. Yeah. So God, in his wisdom, confused the languages so that they could no longer be united. And perhaps they would seek him in their trials and tribulations. Now, so actually, what we've got now is the same as the Tower of Babel. Yes. Because then God was thrown out. Now they're throwing Jesus out again to try and get unity. You have to throw him out. You have to throw him out. Culture. So all of these are an expression of the wisdom of God in creation. Now, ask yourselves, Martin, was it like that in the beginning? No. No. So religious diversity is permitted of God, just like sin is permitted of God. Therefore, any, any negative talk regarding sin, if you put that in the place of this, is not permitted according to the Pope. Mm. And any negative talk in terms of religion is also not permitted by this Pope. Yeah. And then we recognize the importance of the value of the document of human fraternity for world peace in living together between the Holy See and Al-Azhar, Al-Sharif, adopted by the UN General Assembly in resolution so-and-so, is church and state together. Are we, do we have an image? Yes. We have an image. Well, let's go to the Pope's address. And so that the critics cannot say that this is conspiracy theory, let's take it from the Vatican webpage directly. All right, Martin, here is the opening address. Isn't it interesting that the Pope gave the opening address and the final address? Who's the lead man? <laughs> Is obviously. All right. So this is the apostolic journey of His Holiness Pope Francis to Kazakhstan, opening and plenary session of the Seventh Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions. Address of His Holiness. Martin, let's just look at some of the statements either from his opening address or his closing address. And let us see what the mindset is that is being introduced there. Well, he stated, 
It is time to realize that fundamentalism defiles and corrupts every creed. Now, Martin, we know that the creed is always a problem. Correct. And we have a creed, but our creed is the Word of God. Yes. And our particular church denomination that we belong to, right from the beginning, the pioneers said, we have no creed but the Bible. Mm. This is our creed. So, if you have another creed, like, for example, Catholicism has a creed, mm -hmm. and it's written in their catechism. And when I attended religious instruction as a child, I was never confronted with the Bible. I only had to learn the creed, mm -hmm. which was the catechism. And the catechism is absolutely contrary to my present creed, which is the Bible. And I have to make a choice. It's a clash of minds. Yeah. I either accept the creed, which is the Bible, or I accept the creed, which is based on the traditions of men. Yes. And Jesus said, in vain you worship, worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. You set aside the commandments for your traditions. That's, That's exactly what Catholicism does, exactly. right? So you're not allowed to speak against the creed. Did Jesus speak against the creed? Oh, definitely. Did they crucify him as a consequence? That's it. Can we expect the same thing? Yes, because he said so. Time for open and compassionate hearts. It is also time to consign to history, books, the kind of talk that for all too long here and elsewhere has led to distrust and contempt for religion as if it were a destabilizing force in modern society. In other words, what he is saying, let's take the history books, like, for example, Abinier's History of the Reformation, and let's throw it on the trash heap. Mm -hmm. Let's take Martin Luther's table talk and burn it. That's what he's saying. Yes. Not their history. No, not, no, not the theirs. Catholic. No, no, not the no, Catholic. No, no, let's just file that under file 13. These lands are all too familiar with the legacy of decades of state-imposed atheism, that oppressive and stifling mentality for which the mere mention of the word religion was greeted with embarrassed silence. Religion is not a problem, but part of the solution for a more harmonious life and society. We need religion in order to respond to the thirst for world peace and the thirst for the infinite that dwells in the heart of each man and woman. So we need religion. Martin, we need truth. Finished. The truth will that's, set you free. That's it. Not religion. No. Because religion can be based on dumb idols that neither hear nor speak. For this reason, an essential condition for genuinely human and integral development is religious freedom. Now, let's just redefine there because the Pope has made it quite clear that religious freedom is only permissible if it is subject to the common good. Exactly. Brothers and sisters, we are free. Our Creator stepped aside for us in a manner of speaking. He limited His absolute freedom in order to enable us, His creatures, to be free. How can we then presume to coerce our brother and sister in his name? I have never in my entire life heard a more distorted sentence than that. I agree. Jesus came to set the captives free mm -hmm. from error, tradition, self-righteousness, and transgression of God's law. He is embracing all of them. Each person has the right to render public testimony to his or her own creed. Correct. You can do that, no problem. Proposing it without ever imposing it. This is the correct method of preaching as opposed to proselytism and indoctrination from which all are called to step back. Martin, if you read the Word of God and you explain the Word of God, that is a 
injunction, it is a command. And here is his final address. Pseudo-religious terrorism, extremism, radicalism, and nationalism. Isn't it interesting that he dumps that in there as well? Yeah, especially if we take into account the recent Christian nationalism movement that's growing in the United States. States, Mm, Dressed up in religious garb, nonetheless continued to foment fears and concerns about religion. In these days, then, it proved providential that we could come together once more in order to reaffirm the authentic and inalienable essence of religion. Martin, this man is happy to embrace truth and error in one organization. The only thing is, I think they have thrown out the truth. Not once in any of these speeches was the name Jesus Christ mentioned. Can you have truth? Can you have the way without Christ? No. This is a Christless religion. It's a and fraternity. It cannot it this is the exact peace and safety that's based on a lie and has no basis that can go forward. Now in the exact same month that they have this meeting in Kazakhstan and sign this document of fraternity, the Pope instructs the Vatican entities to move all funds to the Vatican Bank by the end of September. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that's interesting. Let's not be predictive in any way, but it is interesting. Definitely something is afoot. Something is brewing. Pope Francis authorized wiretapping phones in financial scandal investigation. He authorized wiretapping. Nixon was impeached for doing that. But this Pope, everybody accepts that that's perfectly fine. Mm. It seems it is the new fine because it's also happening in the United States at every single level. There are so many attempts attempts of impeachment and this and that and the other and wiretapping, this seems to be normal. And with the Pope setting such a wonderful Christian example, then what can you expect, right? It's the same, you see, and he's not waiting for any judges. Even if a judge would not give them grant to do it, he said, go ahead. Go ahead, let's just do it. Uh, Here's another article from the 31st of August. 2022, and it comes from Vatican News. Pope says we are living through Third World War. That's interesting, right? We are in a world war. And it's not the first time he said this. No. So this interesting wording, he's speaking of we are already in a Third World War. Yes. It's not maybe not a physical war yet, but economic war is already going on. Uh, Look at, look at what's happening out there. All the attention of the world is focused on what is happening. Nuclear things that are happening, threats by Putin that uh, he will use nuclear weapons. Mm-hmm. Anyone that supports the war in Ukraine and therefore endangers Russian soldiers can expect retaliation, right? Mm-hmm. And veiled threats of nuclear retaliation. And the world is looking at all of these things. And in the meantime, they are setting in place their structures. And all, everything else is falling apart. And because everybody's focus is on the war, they, okay, it's probably the war's fault. Yeah, everything is the war's fault. So we need prayers for Ukraine. Pope Francis also turned his attention to the ongoing war in Ukraine noting that today we are living through a third world war, one that is being fought piecemeal. So we have to somehow come to a peace accord in that direction as well. 23rd of September, BBC, Ukraine war. Putin is not bluffing about nuclear weapons, EU says. The EU must take Vladimir Putin's threats He could use nuclear weapons in the conflict in Ukraine seriously. The bloc's foreign policy chief has said, 
In a rare address to the nation earlier this week, Mr. Putin said his country had various weapons of destruction and would use all the means available to us, adding, I'm not bluffing. And then he called up 300,000 Russian reserves. So this is escalating, and the world is basically on the brink. And on the one hand, they're speaking peace, peace on the religious level. And on the other hand, they're speaking war, war. Doesn't this sound like the Bible? There will be rumors of war and war, etc. And they will be shouting peace, peace. Now, and then you add into the mix mm -hmm. the climate change. Martin, this is a stew. And it has various components. And we're cooking up a meal to serve to humanity. Yes. Mm, a tasty morsel. Let's throw in a new king. Yeah. Mm, that'll be wonderful. Remember many years ago we spoke <laughs> about the beamable sustainable princes. Yeah. Of which he, of course, was one. So now it's a beamable sustainable king. Now he's a beamable sustainable king. And he has a mantra. Mm and a musical instrument that he's been playing all along. And uh, many things have been written about him and his economic activities and his association with the Economic Forum. Uh, he has an article, Environmental Health News, by Peter Dijkstra, Does Climate Action Need a King? The King Charles III has been right about climate change for decades. And organic farming and biodiversity, here's what he wrote for Newsweek in April. The world is on the brink, and we need the mobilizing urgency of a warlike footing if we are to win. Martin, are we in a war? That's exactly why the Pope said we are in the Third World War. Right. It's not only physical. How long has this war been raging? Which one? The war between good and oh, evil. For nearly 6,000 6, years. Very nearly. <laughs> six, let, let's, not, let's not go further than that because, you know, there are certain corns that will be extremely painful if we go any further than that. But let's just say we are very close, right? The world is on the brink. It's on a warlike footing. Maybe we should listen a little. Henry VIII began what became the 50-year process of quitting Catholicism and founding the Church of England. That took quite a while to undo, right? Yeah, well, 50 years. What do you mean? The, the, this, this quitting Catholicism. Yeah, 50 years to get out of it. 50 years to get out of it, and then the Oxford movement to get back into it. And then the ecumenical movement to seal it up, and the children have returned to the mother prostitute. Yes, and so once again, those demons are back. So if you'd emptied the house, mm -hmm. isn't it interesting that they, em they, they literally cleaned out the house. They took out the images. They yeah. took out the altars. They threw it all out as worthless because they knew, according to Scripture, it was worthless. Mm -hmm. And then through the Oxford movement and that uh, traitor Newman, yeah. they brought it all back in. And he was honored by being made a cardinal and then a saint. Isn't that unbelievable? It just shows you. He's what was made a saint. So seven demons are back. <laughs> seven demons worse than the first. So they've become a house of demons. It was a strong but imperfect example of a British monarch laying it down. My half-serious point here, if Henry VIII could turn the monarchy upside down for his own libido, Charles can vent a bit on an existential issue. I don't know whether Martin, whether I'm being naughty now, but if we look at Charles's history, I wonder whether libido played any part in his decisions in life as well. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. There's one very important point about King Charles III. 
it was historic that the kings and the queens had to be Protestant and that they were called defenders of the faith. Yeah, yeah. Right? Now, Prince Charles is the one that broke that tradition and says he does not want to be known as the defender of the faith. He wants to be known as the defender of faith. Wow, yes, I remember. And he was shown with, he had a Buddhist cloak on and all of he's that. Draw, he's worn Buddhist clothing. He's worn Muslim clothing. He has portrayed himself as the great ecumenical religious <laughs> leader that embraces all religion. He and Kazakhstan fit together beautifully. Wow. And he's representing the Protestant side. And they've become Babylon. Yeah. They're all in a house of demons and every unclean and detestable bird. So let's see what his role was and how he fits into Kazakhstan. Today we are all keen to hear from His Royal Highness his mission for a more cohesive and sustainable world. The interdependence between human health and planetary health has never been more clear. As we start a new decade, it is time to focus on the future we wish to build. To that end, Building on my Sustainable Markets Initiative, I am launching the Terra Carta as the basis of a recovery plan for nature, people, and planet. More than 800 years ago, the Magna Carta inspired a belief in the fundamental rights and liberties of people. As we strive to imagine the next 800 years of human progress, the fundamental rights and value of nature lie at the heart of the Terra Carta. I am calling on CEOs from around the world to engage and play their part in leading the global transition. To guarantee our future, we have no other choice. Martin, the kings of the world will give their power unto the beast. I don't know, it just jumps to mind. And he incorporates the merchants. and uh, he We have the entire Babylon confusion in a package. Martin, the Bible predicts this. Why is it that people do not take cognizance of it? Now, Martin, can you take this climate issue to the same level he compared it to the Magna Carta. He now wants to have a Terra Carta. In other words, the earth must be elevated to the position of deity. Yeah. That's Mother Earth worship. That is pantheism. That is paganism at its best. It has no room for Jesus Christ. No. So he cannot be the defender of the faith because he doesn't have it anymore. He has become defender of faith. Mm -hmm. Anything goes. And he has told us what that faith is. Paganism and pantheism. That's his faith. And does the Pope do the same? Absolutely the same. He loves Pachamama. Yeah. Now, let's see how religious this can become. Returning to Sinai. A prophetic call for climate justice and ceremony of repentance Sunday, November the 13th, 2022, Mount Sinai, in parallel with the COP27 UN Climate Conference. Modern church and state, are they coming on board with this climate thing? More and more. And everything is happening in 2022. They are in a hurry. The final movement will be rapid ones. Uh, very rapid. So in November, between the 6th and the 18th in 2022, 
the UN Climate Conference COP27 will take place on the Sinai Peninsula in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt. Religious communities and religious leaders have a key role to play in addressing climate change and climate justice, which requires deep transformation within society. Does it require a reset? A great reset. On Sunday, November the 13th, religious leaders will return to Mount Sinai. Oh, what a beautiful numerology. We have the venerable day of the sun and we have the 13th. How Masonic. A mountain whose memory and meaning loom large as a place of revelation in the collective consciousness of Christianity, Judaism, Islam and others. That's interesting. It is a site for turning to God and receiving God's message. Martin, God gave his message. He wrote it in stone. If you want to accept it, accept it. It's the basis of his government in heaven. But they want new ones now, don't they? You see, that's a problem. God never changes. It's unchangeable. There it is, written in stone. Well, it was written on stone and put in the Bible for us. Now let's see what these terror worshippers want to do. We return to Sinai in a movement of repentance and quest. We seek a new vision for humanity. The old one's not good enough, Martin? No. And it's endangered existence, and we seek to receive and amplify a message of life-sustaining living and habits that humanity needs to hear today. In this spirit, the project partners will bring together premier religious leaders from the world's major religions to gather upon Mount Sinai to engage in the first ever climate repentance ceremony and to put forth a prophetic interreligious call to action, climate justice, ten universal commandments. Ten new commandments. Well, I'll put this in the realm of blasphemy. Well, Martin, I prefer to stick to God's commandments, which they have all changed or discarded entirely, as many of the Protestants have. And when they swept that house clean, of all these good things, they got seven demons worse than the yeah. first. If you just take the, 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 the scenario, God called them, the Israelites, to the mountain to have this govern, covenant with them. These people are going on the mountain and they are going to demand which ten commandments they want. They're going to do their own thing. All right. Now, we've, we've looked at one side of the issue. Now, we're actually living in incredibly interesting times. Because on the one hand, you have all of this. And on the other hand, you have this movement to bring religion back into politics in a Christian setting in the United States mm. of America. And somehow those will all be fused together in the stew that they are cooking up. Mm. In this American situation, there is talk of changing the Constitution. There is talk of bringing in Christian rules and regulations. Mm. But as we already saw, those Christian rules and regulations won't be the biblical ones. Mm. They will be the papal ones. So there's a deception within a deception. And then you have to have the fusion of the various religious systems, the Jewish and the Christian, and uh, this becomes very interesting. So let's just hear what Jonathan Kahn has to say about where we are in the stream of time and what he believes is going to happen. And remember, he classifies himself virtually as a prophet because he That's constantly says, God showed him, yeah, yeah. and then he writes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a quick nutshell, won't do justice, but it'll give you an idea, and that is that, that you know, the, the world before the gospel was filled with gods, you know, and the Bible says behind the gods are spirits. Now, when Messiah came, he cast out, for he had the power to cast out the spirits. The gospel came into Western civilization, the Roman Empire, and literally cast out the gods cast out the spirits, the greatest exorcism in human history. We have been living in a unique civilization. That's what's made this unique. But the, I won't go into it how, but Messiah, Jesus gave a, 
a warning. And the warning was, if we ever turn away, if a civilization turns away from, the God, from God, having been cleansed, knowing God, turning away from the gospel, the spirits will return. The gods will return to their empty house. And that is exactly what we are witnessing now. Since the beginning of the 1960s, you see a turning point, we started driving out God. Well, it's not going to remain empty. And the amazing thing is the same gods that were there in the Bible, represented the spirits that are represented by those gods in the Bible, and with ancient Israel's fall, have now specifically returned to the world, to America and Western civilization. It's their national it happened to identity. Israel. It's happening to America now. And, and when you look at the time when wow. America starts turning away and the West starts turning away, that's when all the signs of these specific gods come back. And we actually, I can actually, when I was sharing this, going to share what gods they are. The same gods that were there when Israel turned away are the same gods that have returned, the same spirits right now in America. Ending I call them the, the dark trinity. You know, I mean, and these are the, some the main ones. The first one, and you always see at the beginning of the list, is called Baal or Baal. It means the possessor or the master or the owner. And his mission to Israel was to basically drive them away from God. He was the alternate God. He was the substitute God. And it says that he caused them, Baal caused them to forget God. Well, in America, that is what happened as well. It also, it says he caused them to turn away from the commandments. So we have struck down the, the Ten Commandments. We've taken it from public square, just like Israel. The same kind of thing. The next one is the wife of Baal. The, Baal had a wife. In, in the Canaanite um, uh, mythology, it was Ashtoreth. You see her in the Bible, Ashtoreth. That, that was a goddess that is also known in the Mesopotamia as Ishtar. She, she is the goddess, the principality of sexual immorality, sexuality. And so what happens? Look exactly what happens. In the 60s, you have the turning away from God. What happens? We would expect if she returned, the sexual revolution. And that's exactly what happens. It's the, it's the paganization of America through sexuality. Uh, you only the, have a the, 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 the third one, <laughs> I'll just introduce it, is called the destroyer. And this is the one that caused Israel to offer up its children on the altars. And I think everybody's going to already get a thing of where this is going. And we can go there, you know. But that's, that's, that's where it ends up. So Martin, he writes about the return of the gods, and he states that these gods were actually demons. Mm -hmm. They were driven out by Christianity, and then they returned. Now, if he had looked at history in its completeness, uh, it wasn't quite as simple as that. Yes, Jesus brought the truth, and it drove out the demons, in the individuals that chose to accept the yeah. truth. But those demons still remained in the rest of humanity. Because when humanity accepted Christianity, mm -hmm. they didn't accept the biblical Christianity. They accepted a false Christianity under Constantine. Yes, that was actually just changing the names of the demons. Yes, and all of those deities that he mentioned were still in the church, but now in a, in a new form. So the old pagan names that he mentioned, Ashtoreth and Baal and all of these, were replaced with modern ones. And all of those demons were replaced with saints. Mm. And so instead of the female de deities like Isis, etc., you had Mary put in the place instead of all the other forms of these deities, you had various saints put in that place, and they were all mediators. Mm -hmm. So Christianity was never really true Christianity, except in the mountains and the caves. So while all of this was happening in the world, and all of these multiple religions started forming, like Islam only after 600 A.D., etc. All of these religions in the world expanded and Catholicism expanded. They were all paganism. They were all a house of demons. Yep. Let's put it bluntly. That's it. Protestantism cleaned the house. Mm -hmm. Protestantism came to the United States of America. And in that sense he is correct. Protestantism cleaned the house and Protestantism allowed the demons to come back when they didn't adhere to what they believed. Now they are back with Catholicism in the ecumenical movement. Exactly. And now he is saying these demons are back 
and exactly what they did in the past, offering their children to Moloch. So we have the abortion situation in the world, offering children to Moloch, the sexual revolution. All of these things came back. He's now proposing that they clean the house and bring back the commandments of God. The same as we, the other uh, Protestant denominations we saw want yes. to do. Yes. And that's the problem. Now, Martin, when they bring back the commandments of God, we know that is another deception which these people are unfortunately not seeing. No. The commandments that they will bring back are the papal commandments and not the biblical commandments. We have a double blind. Yeah. Then we have for the occult world another exact blind. Because the occult world is preparing for the externalization of the hierarchy. That means the return of the demonic forces. But this can also be twisted mm -hmm. because their savior is Matreya. Their savior is a Christ. Yes. It is the return of the Christ. So when you look at the pictures of those, if you go back to some of those old lectures that I gave on the New Age movement, mm -hmm. for example, where I show what they looked like, all of these demonic entities, they all looked like Jesus Christ. Yeah. So when these demons manifest themselves and Matreya manifests himself, he might even speak on our televisions. He might speak at the United Nations. He might speak at a religious gathering. Mm -hmm. When all of this happens, he will be there like an angel of light and he will lead people in a direction. And he will lead them to the false commandments. Exactly. Saying that he had changed the law. Then you know he is a liar and the truth is not in him because God never changes. So Alice A. Bailey already, remember that she was from Lucis Trust, which was Lucifer Trust in the beginning, but they changed the name that it's not so bad. They said that he will be returning or that this manifestation will commence in the year 2025. I hope it does because I want to go home. Well, it's really building up. If you look at all this, this ecumenical get-together, the fraternity, all of this, the demons or gods, as he's pronounced it, is really returning. Correct. This might become a reality. And, and what will be affected? She talks about the educational, the religious, and the economic. Has to change by 2025. What? Are we seeing this? Yes. I mean, the devil also has an agenda, mm -hmm. doesn't he? Mm -hmm. And this is Lucifer directly that is influencing these people. And so you have all of these web pages. We've, we're going to talk about it in other uh, talks as well. And they all concentrate on the year 2025. This then is the stage of the forerunner in anticipation of a major global transition up ahead in 2025. We're heading for it. It's the great initiation. And they have been singing this great invocation for a long time now within the governments of the world, within the United Nations. They are preparing for this coming of Christ, but it will be the false coming of Christ. It will be Satan presenting himself as an angel of light. So, Martin, once again, when we put this all together, how close do you think we are to the end? <laughs> well, I think the dates here... Tell you a lot. That it must seen. be at the door, right? It's at the door. It's at the door. Be and the way they are pushing their agenda. And there has to be a time of trouble. So you must put all of this also into account. So the time of trouble actually is, is, is active and, and doing its thing when this demonic force is manifested, right? Mm. So Martin, we can expect serious times ahead of us. But when you see these things, let not your hearts be troubled. Yeah. Lift up. Yes, and, and, and let's learn uh, what John tells us. Let's learn it off by heart. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in me. <laughs> Believe. In my Father's house are many mansions, but were not so I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and when I have gone, I will return mm -hmm. so that you can be where I am also. Martin, 
These are wonderful promises. We are in the home stretch. I cannot wait for all of this to happen so that we can go home. I agree with you 100%. Let's, Let's pray. pray. Loving Heavenly Father, what tremendous events are occurring before our eyes. And people are distracted by wars and rumors of wars and threats and fears and economic collapse and bank collapse and, and all of these things so that the devil can get his plan into place. Help us to look behind the scenes, to lift up our heads and know that our redemption draweth nigh. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.